good morning, McDougal Chapel. If you're looking for the Sunday morning service at McDougal Chapel, you found it. One thing that uh, we discovered yesterday as we we're going through the recordings of our services is that is that the service that we usually use didn't get recorded the way that we wanted it to. So we're going to just take a little bit of a pause, and I, I want to make sure that. Uh, um, you get, a, you get a picture of what we're trying to accomplish on Sunday mornings as far as what the message sounds like. And, and hopefully you'll find this, uh, the devotion I'm going to give you helpful. And uh, it'll help you with the series that we're working on called Rooted. Um, do you know what you believe? Just a couple of announcements before we begin. I just want to remind you that if you have any details uh, or want to know any details about what's happening in McDougal Chapel, you can do so at McDougalChapel.com. We have most of our information put up there. And if you have any questions, you can uh, always contact myself for the church office uh, the phone numbers are on the website as well also um, just a reminder that we do ask that if you want to come and join us in person that you would uh, register as we always have and uh, we look forward to seeing um, the great turnouts continue uh, as they have been doing we just want to uh, before we get into God's word I just want to have a word of prayer and then we're going to move into the message for um, for this 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 service so Heavenly Father um, this is kind of strange doing a service this way. Uh, it's not normal. It's not how we usually do it, but that's okay. You work beyond those things. And so I would just pray right now that you would just take uh, what I'm going to say and make it profitable for your kingdom. And uh, I can't wait how you're going to um, bless the people that uh, um, get a chance to fellowship like this right now. And you're going to bless them greatly as they listen to your word. And so, so uh, be with this time in your name. Amen. So we're kind of working through a series called Rooted, Do You Know What You Believe In? And the, one of the reasons why we're doing it is because with the times that we're living in, uh, it, it's kind of hard to navigate uh, uh, what's going on around us. And there's no better time to, to take a look at what you believe as a follower of Jesus and make sure that you are living um, up to those expectations that God has for us. So what we did is we, we came up with this idea of Rooted um, Sermon Series. And the reason why we did it um, is uh, so you can make sure you're on track. Well, we, what we did is we took our doctrinal statement, we just kind of broke it down into the categories that were given on our doctrinal statement, and just kind of give a message about each one, and just so that you have a chance to contemplate what that means to uh, be well-rounded in the different areas of our faith uh, that we have here at McDougal Chapel. And uh, last week we had a great message uh, and a great time together worshiping. We talked about who God was and how he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and... and uh, and then he's everywhere. And, uh, and it was just a reminder to us that, that because God has that power, because he's capable of so much more we can ever imagine, we are fully able to come to him um, just, as, uh, uh, just as we are. Naked, wretched, and poor, it says in the Revelation chapter 3, and that we can come to him and he can take us in that state and say, I want to clothe you, I want to refine you, I want to, I want to mold you. But, but the challenge that we were faced with that message was so many of us don't want to go to him. We don't want to go to him with nothing. We want to hang on to the things that are important to us. And, and we've got to remember that's just a sign of us not giving God control of our lives. And, and it was just a really good time. You can, uh, you can find that message um, on uh, our YouTube channel. It'll be there as well. Also, uh, next week, just you need to know that we're going to be talking about uh, churches and what it means to be the church that Christ wanted to establish here on this earth. And uh, with all the talk going on around our province about, um, you know, do uh, churches need to re um, relaunch earlier than what the government allows or, or uh, should pastors be thrown into jail or what's the church's role? Uh, through a pandemic. We want to talk about that a little bit. And so it's going to be a great service uh, next week. You make sure you, if you want to come in person, bring your friends. This can be that kind of a, a message that, that will uh, hopefully solidify some things about what the church is about and what the church should be doing. But this year we want to talk about humanity and uh, what does it mean to be human? That's the question that, that humanity answers. It's what does it mean to be a human being, especially according to God's word. Our doctrinal statement can be summed up like this. We were created by God as humans, um, and he did it right. He did it right. And uh, not only were we created by God, but we were made to have a relationship with God, have a deep relationship with him, and also have a relationship with others. Now, here's the part of humanity that kind of kicks in that we all understand, is that each one of us is rebellious. We have sin in our lives. 
And so as a result, even though we're created uh, perfectly in God's image, and he, he didn't make any mistakes with any of us, what happens is, is, that, is that our relationships, because of sin and because of a rebellion, suffers. So our relationship with God suffers, our relationship with each other suffers, and as a result, Christ being all-knowing and all-loving and all-caring because of who God is, he, say, he came up with a plan to help with that knowing that that would happen because we have free will. And so what he did is he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on his cross to be an atonement for our sins and our rebellion. And as a result, we can have our relationship restored, not only to people around us, but also to God himself. So here's the difficult part. If God had a great plan like this for humanity, and it truly is an amazing plan because it gives us freedom, all of us gives us freedom. But if he had such a great plan, why do so many people ask the question, why don't I feel special? If I was made in God's image, if that is part of what humanity is to be made in God's image, why don't I feel very special? And, and I think the challenge that, that we need to look at, and uh, this is kind of a thought that I had, is, is that we need to, if we want to understand about what humanity is in God's eyes, we have to understand who we are in God's eyes and stop looking at ourselves through our own eyes. And I'll just say that again. To understand who we are in God's eyes, we need to stop looking at ourselves through our own eyes. I don't know if you know, and I've heard this from many pastors before, but um, we all have labels that we attach, our, attach to ourselves. We have labels that are, are uh, um, maybe correct, and maybe they aren't correct. We all have labels. As a matter of fact, I look at my life and there's labels that I've attached to myself. When I was a kid, I, I, I always thought that I was super shy. So if I, you were to ask me who I was, I would say I'm Kent, the shy guy. And that's just the way it was. I was extremely shy around a kitchen table. If we had company over as a child, I would not talk to anyone. I wouldn't look anyone in the eyes. I just was, was just super quiet that way. Just didn't have a lot of confidence. Now, as I got older, um, I started to change and people saw it, started to see me differently. I started to see myself differently. And uh, one of the things that if you'd ask my wife today, um, what would a label that Kent would have? It would be Kent the, uh, I gotta think of a good one that would be accurate. I think the most accurate one would be Kent the Amazing. I don't think there's anything, any doubt about it. Well, she's not here anyway. The room is empty. So, so basically, I'm going to say that she would say that's Kent the Amazing. One thing we have at this church is we have some interns, and, uh, and I was thinking about that this week. What, what, they, what would they label me as? Who would they call me? And I think they would call me Kent the Perfectionist. And, and I think there's a negative and a positive to that, that label, um, the negative being... Um, <laughs> everything they do, it just seems like they must feel like I just badger them and says, I think it can be done better. And I think we can uh, strive for uh, a, little, a little better quality in some of the things that we accomplish as interns around the church. But also, um, and, you know, the good of it is that they get a really chance to be challenged. So, so I'm okay with that label. Uh, I'm going to work on trying to be very... Uh, um, accommodating to them, um, knowing that not everyone has the same mindset that I do, but, but Kent, the perfection is probably what they would call me. But how do I see myself? That's even a bigger question. Other people can see me a certain way, and that's okay, that's, that's their choice. But how do I see myself? I think I see myself, if I was to be totally honest with you, as Kent the inadequate. Kent the inadequate. And, and the reason why is because every morning when I get up, I, and I tell this to Jody quite often, I just say, I don't think I'm good enough for what I'm doing. I don't think I'm, I'm a strong enough leader, and I don't think I'm smart enough, and, and I don't know if I'm, I can lead this church through this time of COVID. And, I, and that thought comes into my mind so many times. And that's a label that, that I've kind of put onto myself, and I know what the truth is behind it. I know through God's grace um, that I'm capable of some amazing things. And, and I also know that where I'm weak, um, God is strong. And so I understand those things, and I push through, because uh, I certainly haven't stopped pushing yet. But that's the label that I really fight in my life, is that I'm not good enough. So here's the question I have for you. What label have you put on yourself that may or may not be true, but is causing you to um, think negatively of yourself? What do you call yourself inside your brain? Maybe it's uh, your doormat, or maybe you're insecure, or, or maybe you're the person that just can't commit, or, or maybe you're overly sensitive, or, or maybe you're irresponsible, or maybe you're just average. But whatever that label is, that's not who Christ sees you as. You are made in his image. 
And we may get these labels, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that we live in a world that's rebellious to start with, and so we start to believe what people tell us, and, and we ingest that and start to live out what we think people think of us. But that's not how God sees us. As a matter of fact, there's a passage in, in uh, um, 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's in the wall behind me. It's kind of our theme for this year. Um, but it goes like this. And I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. The passage behind me is from the NIV. But it goes like this. It says, if anyone belongs to Christ, anyone who belongs to Christ, sorry, I'll say that I started over again. And then going by memory from the NIV, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. And I love that word person. That's why I'm using this translation because it creates a picture of humanity in there. Anyone who belongs to Christ becomes a new person. The old is gone. A new life has begun. I don't know if you've thought about that passage before, but when it comes to how we think of ourselves, no matter who you are, no matter your past, if you belong to Christ, you become a new person. That's mind-blowing to me. I have a hard time wrapping my mind around that sometimes because I look at myself as Kent the inadequate so many times, but that's not how Christ sees me. I belong to Christ, and he sees me as a new person. And as a matter of fact, the old me is gone. It's not just still there beside me, and uh, I can pull it up and use that label anytime that I want. It is gone, and the new Kent has come, the new person has come. So when we start to think of this idea of new and becoming a new person in Christ, you, you know, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things, but really it can be summed up in, in, in uh, uh, three different ways. Um, you get a new identity in Christ. Um, that's the new person part that we talk about in 2 Corinthians. But there's also the, you get a new future and a new purpose. I remember when I was a kid playing high school basketball in grade 10, and I made the varsity team in Stetler, Alberta. That's where I played uh, some of my high school career. And uh, um, I remember so clearly being just this, this skinny little guy. I'm not very tall, and, and I felt not very, you know, I just made the team. I, I thought in my mind by the skin of my teeth, and, and uh, just worried about would I be able to uh, please the coach well enough to be, get some playing time. And those kinds of things went through my head all the time. I was just average. And I remember going to a, a, one of our first games of the season. It was in Drumheller, and Drumheller had a player who was who was so good. He could shoot from anywhere. He was a, a guard that played the same position as myself, but he was probably about three or four inches taller than me, and just a really solid player. And he was in grade 12, and and uh, he had a man body. I had a little junior high body, and he had a man body. He, there's such a difference in our in our in our this even just the size of us, but his skill set, set and his experience was so much greater than mine. And uh, I remember watching him in warm up going, oh, I don't know if I, I hope I don't have to cover him if I get on the court. And uh, sure enough, before the game starts, uh, we're in the, the huddle before the game, and the coach looks at me and he goes, Kent, uh, your, your job today is to cover number 12. And, uh, and he's a grade 12 student, and uh, he's a good player, but I think you can do it. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm thinking, uh, hold it, coach. Uh, I, I'm just average. I'm shorter than him. I'm not as strong as him. Uh, what makes... You think that I can do that? So the game starts, and uh, I start to. Uh, um, uh, I didn't start the game, and I came in off the bench, and my job was to cover number twelve and, and stop him. So I did what I was supposed to do. You know, I played uh, what I thought was good defense. I bent my knees, uh, um, and did a lot of communicating. Uh, you know, deny defense. I was on the ball defense. I understood all what I was supposed to do. But every time this player got the ball, he scored. Without a doubt, he got the ball and he just walked around me he would, uh, or he'd shoot a jump shot over me, whatever it may be. And it was just like, oh, there I go. There's average Kent. And it was halftime. Coach looks at me and goes, Kent, what are you doing? Like, like wh why are you playing so poorly? And I, and I just said to him, I said to my coach, I was very honest. And I just said, I said, look, coach, I'm just average. I'm grade 10. He's grade 12. He's got way more experience. He's stronger than me. And, and the coach took me by my shoulders. He looked at me in the eyes and he says, Kent, you are not average. You're one of our best defenders, and the reason why I asked you to cover him is because you have the ability to stop this guy. 
And I had to think about there, right there on that spot, right there on the bench, thinking, thinking maybe I can do this. My coach sees this in me and he's giving me this label. Why can't I be the person that stops this basketball player? So the second half starts out and, and uh, um, I get on the court again and, and I start to cover this player and, and this grade 12 student, um, number 12, uh, he starts taking the ball right at me like he did in the first half and lo and behold, I was able to slow him down a bit. I was play, able to play help defense on, uh, uh, um, or push him towards the help defense and do, do those things that I was supposed to do on the defensive end. And in the end, and um, um, he was still a great player, but I started to realize that, you know what, maybe I'm a better defensive player than I thought I was. And that label that I'd given myself wasn't even accurate. And I think that's sometimes what happens to us with Christ. Christ has given us this label saying that you are a new person in me. You have a future, you have a purpose, you have a new identity. And the thing is that we know those things in our words and we hear them in God's word, but when it comes down to living our life as followers of Jesus, we don't actually follow through with it because we don't believe it. There's, there's got to become a time in our lives where you realize, and we all realize, that in our humanity, in our brokenness, God still believes in us. That we have potential. That we are new and we're made new in him. There's a great story in the book of Matthew um, about a guy named Simon. Simon was one of Jesus' disciples. He was uneducated. He was a fisherman. He was unstable and unpredictable. And Jesus was speaking to the disciples in Matthew 16. And Jesus asked Simon, who do people say that I am? And you got to remember, Simon has hung out with Jesus for, for a, few, a few years already and got to know him and, and uh, had developed a deep relationship with him. And, and, and Jesus asked Simon, who do people say I am? And Simon answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus looked at Simon and said, and you got to remember, this is a guy that was a fisherman. He was uneducated. He didn't, have, from the world's perspective, have a lot of potential as far as leadership. He was always saying the wrong thing and doing the wrong thing. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this is not, it was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I will build you, tell you that you are Peter. He, he changed his identity, changed his name. He said, no longer are you Simon, the old Simon. You are now Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Who would have thought that Peter would be able to be used by God for amazing things? The people that knew him probably thought, this guy's always putting his foot in his mouth, and he's always saying the wrong thing. And, uh, and, then, and, and we see in Scripture that, that that's exactly what he did. But Christ saw him as someone that was a rock that he could build his church on. Can you imagine that? The very reason why we meet today in this building on, every, on Sundays and the very reason why people meet all over the world has a lot to do with the fact that Peter, when he was called upon, when the day of Pentecost came and, and, uh, um, and someone needed to give a message, it was Peter that was able to do that. The same guy that denied Christ three times, the same guy that kept uh, um, being a little too aggressive when he shouldn't have been so aggressive, but he was the one that was the rock that the church was built on. He was one that was a catalyst for some amazing things to happen in, 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 in the church that we see today. It was Peter. Was Peter born a rock? Was he born in that position to say, hey, you deserve that label? Of course not. But as he grew in Christ and as he grew in his walk with the Lord, he became that person. He had a future because he became new in Christ. Think about your greatest weaknesses. I want to tell you that God can make those your greatest strengths. He can make you, make, he can take, take what you think of yourself as such a weakness and he can make it something truly amazing. I know that uh, so many times we, we, we think that our labels are who we are forever. But the reality is, is that those are just, you know, part of the part of the way that God helps us learn and, and he teaches us and he molds us through our weaknesses. And as we start to depend on him, it's the amazing thing that happens is that the, 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 the image that God sees in us right from the beginning, right from the womb, it starts to come true and, he's, and, he, and it hasn't changed at all. And we start to become who he thought we could become. And we not only get a new name, we get a new purpose and a new future. There's a story of a lady in the Old Testament. Her name is Rahab. And she's this, uh, this lady that was labeled as a prostitute. Can you imagine being labeled a prostitute? Everywhere you go. As a matter of fact, her name is mentioned eight times in Scripture. And, and out of those eight times, six times, she's labeled as Rahab the prostitute. 
So even in scripture, she's got this label. So she's uh, living in a city that the Israelites want to conquer as they move into their new land. And, and uh, um, she starts to see that these spies that are coming in from the, from the Israelites, uh, she starts to befriend some of them. And she starts to hear about their God. And she says, I want to know your God. Because she's a prostitute. You know, what kind of label does she have? What kind of potential does she have for God's kingdom? But all she says is, I want to understand your God better. I want to have a relationship with God. I want to have a relationship with others. And you, you hear in scripture where she was hoping that the Israelites' God would become her God. And it says that her heart melted when she heard about God. It turns out, after the Israelites come and conquer that city, that Rahab moves in with the Israelites and starts to follow the God of the, the, the God of the Israelites. And she marries a God-fearing man named, named, named Solomon. And Rahab, the prostitute, ends up becoming the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. Can you believe in the line of Jesus way back God used a prostitute. And if he can do that, I want to tell you that the label that you put on yourself, it doesn't hold any water. God sees way more potential in you than you could ever imagine. But the key is this. Rahab saw something in God that made her heart melt. And I think in the world that we live in where we have so much going for us, we have so much at our fingertips and we so much we can do with our own strength, we don't let God melt our heart. Yet in reality, if we would just do that, I believe that we would truly see our potential. So how do we do that? Just to wrap up, I just want to remind you of Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Paul's being persecuted, he's in prison, times aren't very good, and he says this. Forgetting what is behind... Forgetting what is behind. Okay, so think about it. Who were you before Christ? Now you belong to Christ, you become new. What is behind you? Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Okay, the future that God has for you. I press towards the goal, Paul says, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And I think that's, that's a, a snapshot of the picture that we need to, we need to hold on to it in our brains. That's the posture that we need to have, is that what is behind that label that we used to have, we are not that anymore. God sees us so much differently than we see ourselves, and we need, to deliver, we need to say that label that's behind me, and it might not happen overnight. You might have to work at it. You might have to go to counseling. You might have to seek help. It could be so many different ways to start to eliminate that label, but you need to start forgetting what is behind and strain forward to what God has in for us, before us, straining for what's ahead. And that's to um, live out your potential as a follower of Jesus, a follower of Jesus Christ. So hopefully this has been an encouragement to you. This is something that I've been kind of learning as I, uh, I'm, I'm Kent the inadequate so many times, but I'm learning that that's not how God sees me. He sees me as so much more and he's giving me so much more, more than I think I can even handle sometimes. And he would do the same for you. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt in my journey as a pastor, not once has my God thrown me under the bus. Not once has he left me high and dry. He's always been there with, uh, with people around me or wisdom I don't, didn't deserve or, or uh, an ability that I thought I didn't know I had that. There's something that happens that God shows that he's walking with me. And he can do the same for you. But you have to remember, and it's that sign that says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. He's become a new person. The old is gone. The new has come. And that's your story. It's my story. It's who we are in Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, for those that are listening today, I just pray that uh, um, you would just minister to their hearts today through your word. And I just pray that the devotion that I shared today would be one that uh, would be of encouragement and would give people hope. And for those labels that people are holding, Lord, I just pray that they would be gone. That's the old you. That's the old them. And that has been eliminated when we said we belong to you. We become a new person. So God, um, I just pray that, uh, yeah, people that, that hear your voice through my words, that they would be courageous enough to make changes they need to make. In your name we pray. Amen. 
we want to close off the service with a song. Um, this is in normal church. Like I said, uh, um, our equipment didn't work very good on Sunday, so we've had to redo this uh, recording, but hopefully it's been beneficial to you. Um, but I also want you to um, use some time and to reflect on what God is speaking to you about. We could turn off the video right there and that would be done, and, and I guess that's fair. But if you want to sit around and meditate some lo so a bit longer, Lauren Daigle has a song called You Say. And uh, it's an amazing song that kind of speaks to that, this topic that I've been sharing. And if you want to just listen to it right now, it's going to be on your uh, on this video. And uh, just use it as your time to, to contemplate how God sees you. Use it as a time to change your life and make changes you need to. And uh, um, if you have any questions, make sure you contact me. Go to mcdougalchapel.com and uh, you can find a way to contact me there. Um, blessings to you all and I hope you have an amazing an amazing week.